The treatment of adult acute lymphoblastic leukemia remains a clinical challenge. The strongest predictor of relapse is minimal or measurable residual disease, known as MRD. And ALL is now the first hematologic neoplasm for which assessment of early response to therapy by MRD monitoring has proven to be a fundamental tool for guiding therapy. In this OncLive peer exchange panel discussion, I'm joined by a panel of experts in adult leukemia. We will discuss the latest advances in the treatment of ALL and MRD testing as a key component in individualizing care for each patient. I'm Dr. Mark Litzo, Professor of Medicine at Mayo Clinic's campus in Rochester, Minnesota, and Chair of the ecog Akron Leukemia Committee. Joining, to me, joining me today are Dr. Ryan Cassidy, Associate Professor in the Division of Hematology at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Assistant Member in the Clinical Research Division at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington. Dr. Jay Park, Associate Attending Physician in the Division of Hematologic Oncology and the Director of the Adult Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia Division at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, New York. And Dr. Rachel Rao, Assistant Professor in the Department of Pediatrics, Section of Hematology Oncology at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, let us begin. Ryan, can we start off and uh, could you describe the complexity of ALL management and the heterogeneity of the disease based on some of the factors we know such as age, age disease biology and prognosis and maybe touch on what some of the most important prognostic factors are? Sure, Mark. So um, prognostic factors in, in ALL, there are several that have been around and stood the test of time over years. Uh, older age, whether you're a uh, pediatrician, that could be uh, age 10 or higher. For those of us that treat adult leukemia, obviously that's not the most practical prognostic tool. Uh, so there it tends to be more uh, 35 and up has historically been considered starting to be a high risk factor. But certainly as you get into older ages, 60, 65 and over, that's a particularly challenging patient population to treat. Biologic factors like cytogenetics and more and more uh, genomic molecular data are becoming to be understood more about prognostic features in ALL. Um, immunophenotype, particularly the early thymic precursor subtype of T-cell ALL is a prognostic feature. Um, some of, and the Philadelphia chromosome, of course, is an important one as well, but primarily in B-cell ALL. So oftentimes we use a lot of these tools to try to prognosticate how likely a certain treatment is gonna work and to a certain extent can help predict a particular treatment path as well. Okay. Rachel, could you comment uh, from the pediatric standpoint about uh, what are some of the most important factors in this area? Yes, so our, <coughs> our prognostic capacity is, is quite well defined, I feel, and it's been further refined over the last several years. Uh, the primary feature we base our initial upfront therapy on would be the patient's so-called NCI Rome risk criteria. And that is based on the patient's age of diagnosis, if you're between the age of one and 10, uh, and if you're presenting white blood cell count being less than 50,000 at the time of diagnosis, you're considered NCI standard risk. Patients who are older than the age of 10 at the time of diagnosis or have a white cell count greater than 50,000 are considered NCI high risk. Um, so that is what at least we in the Children's Oncology Group use to determine what our initial uh, induction therapy will be comprised of. An additional sort of poor risk factor uh, determined by age are infants, uh, which is a particularly challenging group of patients to manage uh, with very poor outcomes. Beyond that, we also uh, rely heavily on uh, cytogenetic features, uh, as well as the pH positive and the pH likes are now categorized differently and treated differently. Uh, and then MRD, of course. Uh, we incorporate an early MRD time point in the peripheral blood, as well as end induction time points, and later time points of therapy are now being incorporated as well. Okay, well thank you. You know, Ryan, you mentioned the Philadelphia chromosome. Rachel, you mentioned pH-like. Um, those are somewhat confusing terms. I know, Jay, could you elaborate a little bit about what, what those terms mean? And Sure. So Philadelphia chromosome are the, the translocation of the chromosome 9 and 22 portion of the T922 translocation or BCL-ABLE translocation. So there are two different transcript types, P190 and P210, uh, the both of which can occur in ALL patients, P190 being more common. I think in adult patients, about 20% of the time it could be P210 transcript. So those are true Philadelphia chromosomes, called Philadelphia chromosome, that particular translocation uh, and uh, incidence increases with age. Um, so older age patients will can have the frequency of 30 to 40% of the time they could be pH positive. So it is very important that because treatment is actually different 
uh, for those patients, a particular tyrosine kinase inhibitor that can be used and added to the, uh, the line of a therapy. So especially older patients, for all patients who are newly diagnosed with ALL, the testing for that particular mutation is very important at the beginning uh, because, again, it can change prognosis and then the more commonly the management uh, at the time. PH like or Philadelphia chromosome like are more recent, although it's now well established, and then incidence of which also increases with the age too, although it seems to plateau once you get to kind of young adults, kind of the level in about you know the 20% of the time that it could be up to 20% of the time could be PH like. And I guess it's named because the gene expression profile of those patients, even though they do not have a 922 translocation or PCR able, can have a similar gene expression profile pattern as those patients who have Philadelphia chromosome. I think importantly, some of this PH like uh, the subtypes can also be sensitive to potentially to TKI because they may involve translocation involving ABL uh, or JAK-STEP pathways, and they may be, put, you know, there are targetable agents. Obviously, we're investigating whether those patients should be treated differently. I think that's kind of one of the areas in adult patients and kind of the interest to hear kind of what Rachel say about the pediatric patients with knowing that information does it really change what we do. We test a lot, and, uh, and there are a whole bunch of different ways to testing, which is not quite standardized, which makes it a little bit challenging in some of the adult the setting to kind of look for this mutation. Well, the Philadelphia chromosome is very, the 922 short location could be easily detected by fish, uh, but you know, the, the pH-like uh, fish could detect a kind of good number of them, the CRLF2 translocation about 50% of the time, but the rest of them may not be easy to. But again, the question is, with that information, you know, that does it change management of ALF patients at this time? It is a, it is a more heterogeneous group than the, than the Philadelphia yeah. chromosome, which is kind of monolithic in some sense, although there's some heterogeneity there as well.